I now move on to the next item of business. That's a statement by Michael Russell on UK government negotiating mandate. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. I call Michael Russell, Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I wish to provide, as you know, an update on the publication last Thursday of the UK's government's approach to negotiations with the EU and on the negotiations process itself, which began on Monday this week. There's no doubt that this is a document which, if the intentions within it are turned into reality, will result in the people of Scotland being worse off financially, cut off practically, and turned off politically from the European mainstream. It's a document that reveals beyond peradventure that the UK government is now in the hands of ideological extremists. Mark Drakeford, Wales's First Minister, summed up the position for many of us when he said, yes, extremists like that. M the, Mark Drakeford, Wales's First Minister, summed up the position for many of us when he said last week, over the last three and a half years, we have taken every opportunity to speak to UK ministers about the specific concerns we have on protecting and promoting the Welsh economy, providing evidence and proposals. The UK government has chosen a very different course. The mandate they have published means that Wales' vital interests are not represented in these negotiations. When the UK government begins these negotiations next week, the most important in 50 years, it will be doing so on its own. As for Wales, so for Scotland. Let me first of all tell the Chamber the extent of the devolved administration's involvement with this document. I set this out in more detail than usual to dispel any suggestions from the UK government that we had a meaningful role in shaping their approach. We received what was clearly a virtual final draft on the morning of the Friday the 21st of February. The sharing at least looked like progress. It did not, however, include the section on justice and security. I'm grateful to all those officials who worked tirelessly over the weekend to produce a detailed response, which I approved late on Sunday the 23rd, and which went back to the UK government in my name on the morning of Monday the 24th. At 8.30 a.m. on Tuesday the 25th, there was a conference call between the UK government and the devolved governments. We were assured that our concerns were being taken seriously. But when we saw the final document, a mere hour and a half or so before it was presented to the House of Commons two days later, there had been some minor cosmetic changes, but the substance and tone had been, if anything, hardened. So the devolved governments are once again being managed, not engaged. The JMC EN last met in Cardiff on Tuesday the 28th of January. At the conclusion, the three devolved governments made it clear that they needed to see the legal texts and the working papers which were part of the process of producing the negotiating mandate. This did not happen, and indeed the JMC has not been convened since. Consequently, we have not agreed the way in which the devolved governments will be involved in the second stage negotiations, nor how we would reach a common mind on any issue to be negotiated, though there is a proposal from me on the table of a three-room structure. But not only has the final mandate now been published, the negotiations have started. This is not only contrary to the terms of reference of the JMCEN, it is contrary to the devolution settlement. For it is devolved issues such as agriculture, environment and fisheries that will be at the heart of these negotiations. As the legally and politically responsible body, this parliament and this government must be involved in deciding what stance to take. My elected ministerial colleagues are keen to have those discussions. I'm sure this parliament is keen to see those discussions take place. But clearly, the unelected David Frost is not. Presiding officer, as I've said, the section on the paper on justice and security wasn't shown to us. We only saw it in the final published paper. It is also unacceptable in tone and substance. The UK government must respect and take full account of the Scottish legal system, our separate courts, prosecution system, and police. To fail to do so would be a breach not just of convention, nor even of the devolution settlement, but of the basic premise on which the UK is founded, for that includes protection for our own legal system. Our representations to the UK government over the past three and a half years have been clear that Scotland did not vote for Brexit. But that democratic fact has been ignored, even when we've offered compromise. Indeed, in the introduction to the published mandate, they add insult to injury by explicitly referring to the unique characteristics of the Crown dependencies, like Jersey and Guernsey, but completely rejecting any need for a similar approach to the ancient nation of Scotland. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government does not believe that Boris Johnson has any mandate in any part of the UK for a form of Brexit which was regarded as being on the lunatic fringe of politics, even during the June 2016 referendum. That form of Brexit, which the UK now regards as optimum, is a Canada minus deal, the most basic of free trade agreements. Undoubtedly, this will mean new barriers and borders, 
trade inhibiting rules of origin, customs difficulties, and heavy regulatory requirements. The approach will also have a severe impact on many of Scotland's most important sectors. For example, the Scottish seafood industry, which in 2018 exported 696 million pounds of produce to the EU, will be severely disadvantaged by it. Scottish food producers will suffer, and there are real concerns among the farming community about food standards. Elsewhere, though services account for around 75% of the Scottish economy, Scotland will be shut out of key EU services markets if the Prime Minister's ambition is realised. Presiding officer, although the UK document makes no attempt to quantify the economic impact of the UK government's approach, already published Scottish government modelling indicates that if the UK government secured a basic free trade agreement of the type it is pursuing, Scottish GDP would be 6.1% or £9 billion lower by 2030 than if the UK retained full EU membership. This is equivalent to £1,610 per person. The UK government has also made it clear it's prepared to walk away without a trade deal, which would raise this figure to 12.7 billion, equivalent to 2,300 pounds per person. In contrast, the UK-US negotiating mandate published on Monday does attempt to quantify the potential economic impacts of a post-Brexit trade deal with the US, suggesting that such a deal could boost the UK economy by 0.16% over the next 15 years. This will in no way make up for the damage caused by the UK's approach to the EU negotiations. It is a distraction. And very significantly, presiding officer, previous UK government modelling from 2018 suggests damage for the UK as a whole from its current approach. Back in 2017, my then UK counterpart, David Davis, said that a comprehensive free trade agreement and a comprehensive customs agreement would, in his words, deliver the exact same benefits that we have had with EU membership. That was then and is now nonsense. But tragically, it may soon be very expensive nonsense with the price being paid by every one of us. Yet, presiding officer, the impacts of the UK government's approach will also not simply be about numbers. The loss of freedom of movement means our citizens will have curtailed opportunities to live, work, study, travel, and retire abroad. It will lead to a serious long-term shortfall in the workers needed in our economy. We also know that its impact will, uh, will be worst upon those who can afford it least, like the disabled and those in remote areas. And we're also likely to be less safe. We now know that the UK is not seeking membership of Europol or Eurojust or participation in the European Arrest Warrant or the European Investigation Order. There is no guarantee that the alternative arrangements that the UK proposes will be agreed. And even if they are, those arrangements would be likely to be much less effective than those we currently enjoy. These EU tools help to keep people safe and secure by facilitating rapid information sharing and effective cooperation between police and prosecutors in the prevention, investigation and prosecution of crime. The UK government is also lukewarm about the UK's participation in EU programmes such as Erasmus Plus and Horizon 2020 and has actively abandoned involvement in other cross-border programmes such as Creative Europe. And we are now told that the UK, that we will not, by the UK, that we will not be allowed to take up individual membership for devolved governments if the UK does not join any European programme as a third party. Allowed is a significant word. That is how the UK government sees the rights of the devolved governments, matters for which permission can be given or withheld. Presiding officer, the Scottish government does not intend to allow this situation to continue. We reject the published mandate as it is. We will make clear that the UK government, if it attempts to speak on matters of devolved competence, does not speak for us. We will ask this parliament not to agree actions or agreements if they have not been discussed with us. We will also shortly introduce the continuity bill, which will give this parliament and our government powers to keep pace with European regulation. We will do so confident in our right to take those actions in areas which are devolved. The extent to which devolved law aligns itself with the law of the EU is a decision for this Scottish Parliament to take, not the UK Government. Of course, we will always be willing to discuss the negotiating position on devolved matters if that discussion is meaningful and respects the devolved settlement. And we will intensify our work to ensure that Scotland gets the right to choose its own future and invite every member in this chamber to endorse that right and help to obtain it. The delivery of that right is not the delivery of independence, it is simply the basic confirmation of democracy. No one speaks for us and no one speaks about us without us.
Presiding officer, we are now entering an even more difficult phase of the Brexit process, which if handled in the way the UK government proposes will have severe negative impacts for the vast majority of people in Scotland. I continue to urge the UK government to move back from their aggressive rhetoric and ideological obsession with delivering a very damaging hard Brexit. But I also urge this chamber to speak up for Scotland and to put differences aside to do so. The time and the threat demand that response from all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement. I intend to allow up to 20 minutes for questions, after which we must move on to the next item of business. Question one, Murder Fraser, followed by Alec Rowley. Mr Fraser, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for the, uh, an advanced copy of his statement? And given his uh, recent announcement, can I take this opportunity to wish him well on his upcoming retirement from this Parliament and whatever he chooses to do thereafter? However, we still have another year of this to get through, so let me turn to the substance of his statement. And I have to say to him that when we are dealing with what are very serious matters, throwing around ludicrous hyperbole, such as referring to the lunatic fringe, does him no favours at all. And the irony of this government referring to others as ideological extremists will not be lost on many observers. Presiding officer, despite all the manufactured outrage, the Cabinet Secretary at least acknowledges that the Scottish Government and other devolved administrations did, did have advanced sight of the UK Government's approach to negotiations prior to publication. And it is an approach to negotiations whose mandate rests on both the 2016 referendum result and the UK general election. And it is an approach to negotiations whose mandate rests on both the 2016 referendum result and the UK general election outcome in December, despite without independence. Yeah. It's all it has ever been about, and any pretense of trying to work constructively with the UK government has been abandoned. Yeah. But in an effort to make some constructive progress, let me ask the Cabinet Secretary this. At the weekend, the French government indicated that they were demanding full access to our fishing waters as a precondition for trade discussions. Does the Scottish government support the stance of the UK government in refusing that demand, or is it still the policy of the Scottish Government that we should remain members of the hated common fisheries policy? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, uh, I thank uh, Murray Fraser for his kind words to me. I assure him I uh, have plenty to do in the next year, uh, and I will be very busy. Uh, I would commend to him the approach that I am taking, which is this, to choose my words carefully, to make sure that I stand up for Scotland, to defend the interests of the people I represent, and not to stand in the position of ensuring that the damage to them is, takes place as a result of what the UK is planning. I noticed that the member did not, in a single moment or word, refute the statistics I put in front of this chamber. The economic damage that will be done, the way in which the devolved competence is being undermined, that was not disputed. We had just the reversion to the tired old question. Let me tell him the answer to that question. I will stand up for the rights of Scottish fishing communities and the fishing industry across Scotland. The best way the UK government could do that is to work with the Scottish government in the negotiations that are currently underway, not to sideline the Scottish government in those negotiations. Fishing is a devolved competence. The lack of recognition of that, the lack of willingness to work on that, is what will do immeasurable damage to the fishing communities that I represent. I think it is time, Mr. Fraser, thought of the people of Scotland, not Boris Johnson and the UK government. Alec Rowley. Thank you, President Officer. I would begin by joining Mr. Russell in making clear that the actions and behaviour of the UK government in the way they are approaching Brexit is totally and utterly unacceptable. I do hope that in this chamber we can all agree that it's not acceptable for Mr Johnson and his advisers to approach Brexit in this way and that we can send a clear message that this parliament supports this government and the Welsh government and having their voices heard in the negotiations. The devolution settlement must be adhered to. Can I say to Mr Russell that the levels of economic damage that will come from this approach is concerning, yes, to us and yes, to the Welsh Government,
but also to many of the regions of England as expressed by regional leaders and mayors. Does he agree that the best way to change this approach is to unite all the nations and regions who are expressing the similar concerns that we are? So rather than making this an issue just for Scotland, we should be bringing all interested parties together across the UK to build a campaign of unity in the best interest of the people of Scotland and the best interest of the people of the United Kingdom. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I'm grateful to Mr Rowley for his much more positive and much more constructive contribution. Um, and I have to say to him that I do agree that there are likely to be very, very severe problems uh, right across England uh, as a result of, of this approach. But uh, there is a, a, an issue, and I, I am a Democrat, there is an issue of democracy in here. The people of England in the majority voted for Brexit. I don't believe they voted for this, no, and I was just about to make that point to Mr Rowley, he has got there before me. They didn't vote for this type of Brexit, and I do hope that there will be, that will be made very clear by their representatives. But I'm not trying to say to the UK government that they do not have a mandate for Brexit within the UK as a whole. What I am saying is they have to recognize the mandate within Scotland, within Northern Ireland, to recognize there are different points of view, and to work with everybody to try and get a better deal than the one they seem to want to put on the table. This is a long, long process. Those of us who uh, have been in it really since the, the more or less since the, the referendum in 2016, recognized some really major problems, one of which was the failure of Theresa May ever to sit down with the people that Mr. Rowley is talking about right across these islands and to say, how could we get an agreement? And, and the whole thing has been poisoned by that. I will work with anybody to make sure that the current form of Brexit does not happen. But I do believe there is a solution for Scotland, and I think avoiding that solution does not serve the people of Scotland well. I have 15 minutes and 10 people want to ask questions. Succinct questions and answers, please. Annabel Ewing, followed by Adam Tompkin. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, page four of the UK Government's negotiating mandate appears to recognise the need to respect the separate legal systems of Scotland and Northern Ireland. However, uh, on page 25, the reference is to the UK legal system and the need to avoid constraining it. Does this contradictory language give the Cabinet Secretary confidence that the UK government will recognise and respect Scotland's distinct legal system during negotiations? Cabinet Secretary. Look, I think the member is absolutely right. This is a major area of concern. I indicated in my statement. Uh, and of course, it is an area of concern that will have an impact uh, upon every citizen in Scotland. But it is also against the, essentially the foundation principles uh, of the UK. Uh, you can't believe in the union, but in actual fact, play la fast and loose with the, the documents that underpin it. And in this case, there is a severe damage going to be done to the Scottish legal system, to the independence of the prosecutor, a whole range of areas, and it's going to be done without consultation, without involvement of Scotland. That cannot be allowed to happen. Adam Tompkins, followed by William Watt. Uh, thank you, presenting Officer. The um, Cabinet Secretary makes a big claim in this statement that the, the mandate is contrary to the devolution settlement, he says. I think that claim is completely without foundation. But does the Cabinet Secretary not agree that there is not a single provision of any of the Scotland Acts that is countermanded by any provision in the mandate published last week. Yeah. No, I do not agree. I, I, I understood that Mr. Tompkins had moved to consider strategy. I think that strategic uh, approach appears to have failed already. I do not agree on that. Obviously, I do not agree on that. I think there are many areas in which the, the mandate cuts across the devolution settlement. And in those circumstances, and, and, we, and, in the, and I have made, named several <coughs> in my statement. And we intend, I mean, well, I have to say that Mr. Tompkins is, as ever, reduced to shouting from the sidelines, which is, of course, what the Tories do. Uh, what they should be doing, is, what they should be doing in Scotland, what they should be no, doing in Scotland. No, no, stop, Ebdi. I want to hear the answer. I want questions and answers. Well, don't heckle. Could we have the answer? Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. What, we, what the Tories should be doing in Scotland, if I may give them some helpful advice, is to stop tying themselves to Boris Johnson's apron strings and stand up for the people of Scotland. The more they shout from the sidelines, the less the people of Scotland will trust them, and trust in them is at an all-time low anyway. You're still heckling, Mr. Tompkins. I know you understand the meaning of the word. Maureen Watt, followed by Claire Baker. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. The loss of freedom of movement, which will result from the UK Government's current stance, will have a huge impact, not only on those who value our close connection with Europe, but also on vital immigration, including in my constituency, where food processors and others rely on migrant workers. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline his view on the UK Government's points-based immigration system, which will replace it? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The, the points, uh, recommendation for a points-based system has been opposed not just by this government, which has put forward constructive alternatives, but it's been uh, opposed by virtually every significant employer and trade body in Scotland, all of which know that damage will do. I heard a, a moan coming from the Tory benches. I hope it wasn't from Mr Carson when it was raised, freedom of movement. The reality is that Mr Carson, who is a farmer, must know the damage that this would do to the agriculture and food industries in Scotland. It is clear. It is being said by the National Union of Farmers. It is being said widely across the country. And it is impossible for Tory members just to put their heads in the sand and pretend it isn't happening. This, this will be an economic disaster. Bodies which are in no sense uh, radical, irresponsible or mad gnats are saying absolutely clearly that this will be awful for them. But all the Tories can do is sit and moan when the facts are presented to them. Claire Baker, followed by James Dornan. Um, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary has set out the predicted outcomes of the approach being taken by the UK Government, and I agree with the extent of the damage it will cause Scottish business, particularly if we end up with a no-trade deal. Is work being done in preparing for a no-trade deal, while that is the outcome we all want to avoid? Is consideration being given to what support may be needed for businesses or for in investment in port infrastructure, for example? Uh, the member raises a good point. Uh, we have, of course, some uh, experience of preparing for no de deals. That's expensive experience. It, uh, it absorbs a great deal of bandwidth and absorbs a great deal of money. But we continue to be uh, involved in that and we continue to prepare for a no deal because it is, as we've seen from the aggressive statements that have come in the House of Commons and elsewhere, it is something that some Tories actually welcome. I mean, extraordinarily, but they welcome it. And we are absolutely determined we will do our best to uh, ensure that its effects are mitigated in Scotland. But of course, as I've said often from this position before, we will not be able to totally overcome them. And that's the reality of a no deal. A no deal is an even worse disaster. James Dornan, followed by Ross Greer. Thank you, President Officer. The negotiating mandate seeks to place Scotland and the rest of the UK as far from the EU as possible. Has the Cabinet Secretary been given any explanations from the UK Government as to why it is so intent to create a situation of as little alignment as possible? Cabinet Secretary. I, I think the, where the UK Government is now is uh, simply a, 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 an illogical extension of an extension of the red lines that they signed on to very early on. If you are utterly obsessed with the issue, for example, of the European Court of Justice and its jurisdiction, then you eventually get to the ludicrous position that you cannot accept its jurisdiction in anything. So you get to the position, for example, that when you look at entirely reasonable, helpful, uh, important issues, such as the, the regulation of road transportation in Europe, and you will not take part in that because you do not wish jurisdiction from the European Court of Justice, and you're going to set up your own body, uh, and you're going to then look at some sort of alignment and hope it works. You, you, the, the UK government's found itself in a nonsense, Alice in Wonderland position, but it continues to espouse it. And it will, it will lead and is leading to disaster. And it is important we say that. It is important we say the emperor has no clothes. The Scottish Tories may see, the to Scottish Tories may see some wonderful raiment around Boris Johnson. <laughs> I see nothing at all. Ross Greer, followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you. The Greens share the Scottish Government's immense frustration at the UK Government's attitude towards schemes like Horizon 2020 and Erasmus Plus that have brought such immense benefits to Scotland. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the Scottish Government believes the UK Government has a legal basis for its stated position of seeking to exclude Scotland from such schemes if there were unilateral attempts to participate? And are such unilateral attempts to stand up for Scotland's best interests something the Scottish Government is considering? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I am considering it actively. I know that there is a very strong support for Erasmus Plus uh, within uh, Scotland as a whole. There's support in the other devolved uh, areas as well, and we will want to see that move forward. There should be no question, but if the UK government decide, for whatever reason, not to participate, uh, and I think their analysis is deeply flawed, and we've argued it for some time, uh, then the options should exist for the devolved administrations to take that up 
and in addition, the resource that is presently applied to that should be divided amongst the devolved administrations for them to be able to make the decision with the same amount of money. The principle of no detriment should apply to this as to all other matters in, in Brexit, and I would want to see that happen. If, however, there is a dog in the manger attitude from the UK government that says uh, we're not taking part and we're telling you that you're not taking part either, we will resist that to the ultimate. Willie Rennie, followed by Angela Codds. Uh, the Minister and I share deep concerns about Brexit and the economic damage that it will cause. There's no doubt about that. But as we've discussed before with the Continuity Bill, it would be helpful to keep pace with EU regulation to smooth trade and relations with our European neighbours. But how will the Minister ensure that in doing so, this does not hinder trade and regulations and relations with the rest of the United Kingdom? Cabinet Secretary. Mr. Rennie makes a good point. Uh, it is important that that happens. Uh, we don't believe that any of the proposals we have would do that. Uh, it is possible to uh, be able to operate effectively across borders, as we know. Uh, that's what trade does. We, people tend to trade with their nearest neighbours. We want to put together a, a system of keeping pace that enhances our ability to, to keep the best but also make sure that we can continue to operate with everybody, including our closest neighbours. And I think the point that Mr Rennie makes can be addressed constructively during the development of the bill. And I, as the, Mr Rennie knows, I believe that when all bills are introduced to this parliament, they can be developed. They do not arrive perfect or fully formed. Uh, and in those circumstances, I look forward, if the Liberal Democrats are keen to take part in developing the bill, the I'm keen to work with them on that matter. It. I'd be happy to work with Mr Rumbles, and I've rarely said that in my life before. <laughs> Angela Constance, followed by Liz Smith. Thank you, President Officer. From his interactions with the UK Government and others, has the Cabinet Secretary seen or heard any explanation as to why the negotiating mandates pay far less attention to the needs of Scotland? As to why the negotiating mandates pay far less attention to the needs of Scotland and by contrast pay more attention to Jersey, Guernsey and the Irish remain in the EU so much for a partnership of equals? I, 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 certainly, I understand the point, and I made the point myself, but I don't want to diss my friends in Jersey, Guernsey, and the Isle of Man. I, I, I see them often in the British Irish Council. I think that, uh, I think that they have uh, fought well and, and valiantly for their rights, but of course they are in a different position to ourselves. Uh, but it does certainly puzzle me. I mean, they're not part, for example, of the JMC process. It does puzzle me that there is such a determination to make sure that Scotland should have nothing uniquely, absolutely uniquely, because if you look across these islands, Wales, regrettably, but it, it is true, voted uh, for Brexit. Uh, Northern Ireland voted against Brexit and has a very special set of circumstances. Uh, uh, England voted for Brexit, and you know, many people regret that, but it did. Scotland absolutely clearly and by a big majority voted against Brexit, and yet uniquely it is to receive no special treatment at all. Uh, that is an issue which not only this chamber should address, I would have thought that the Scottish Conservatives would wish to address this, no but uh, maybe, maybe that is the problem. They are Scottish Conservatives. They just don't recognise how important Scotland should be to them. Liz Smith, followed by Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you. Well, on that theme, the Cabinet Secretary has referred a great deal in his statement to all the costs to the Scottish economy of the Brexit process. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, when will the Scottish Government publish an updated assessment of the costs that would be incurred to the Scottish economy should we ever be an independent country and suffer the trade problem of a hard border with our most important partner in England? I have to say to Liz Smith, uh, I have to say to Liz Smith uh, you know, with whom I've done a lot of good work and, and, and whom I am fond, I hope that doesn't damage her career <laughs> in, uh, or, even, or even her personal life in these circumstances, uh, I just have to say that that was not worthy of her. We have, we have, and I say that, I say that very nicely because we have published a great deal of material and will continue to publish it. But if anybody now looks at the current situation and can say to me, oh, Scotland would still be better off not making its own decisions, they're not reading the information, they're not thinking about it, and they're certainly not thinking of their constituents. And Fulton McGregor, please. Thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that whether or not Scotland continues in EU programmes, devolved areas such as Erasmus should be a matter for this Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament and not the UK Government? Cabinet Secretary. There's absolutely no doubt. The decision of what programmes we participate in should be a decision for us and the resources to allow our participation should be part of the, the discussions about how we move forward financially. There have been no discussions of that at all. I have seen nothing from the UK Government, for example, about how they intend to fund and support the so-called Share Prosperity Fund, but of course there should be decisions for us. 
Thank you. That concludes questions in the statement. There will be a short pause if we allow the front benches to change to the next item of business.